To understand my story, you sort of have to know a tiny bit about trespassing laws in our country, and that we don't have any so long as you're respectful and not destructive. You can walk over any hills that you like, and in my case, camp on any beach if you're choosing, as long as you leave the area how you found it. I used to love camping when I was little. Our family would go multiple times a year with a large group of my parents' friends and their kids. On average, there were maybe 10 of us at a time, which was a bit of a logistical challenge, since we always headed out to this one really remote beach on the coast. Actually, we weren't the only ones. There were always yachts bobbing just off the shore with people in them, and other campers lining up and down the beach. Most of them also had children or teenagers, so it wasn't a wild party scene. It was very much an informal family holiday spot. There was even a small building with toilets and showers installed nearby, even though this was in the middle of nowhere. I guess the local council must have figured out and got sick of people peeing behind bushes. We took a trip up in the spring of 2011. I'm really bad with time, but I know this because I got my dog in the winter of 2010. After picking her out that November from the shelter, as a birthday gift from me to me, as I paid her adoption fee. Everyone, I know you love dogs and she will be very important to the story later, so let me tell you a little bit about Parmesan. Parmesan came to me as a six-month-old puppy who had been rescued from a dog fighting situation. We're not entirely sure what breed she is exactly, but my best guess is a lurcher as Staffy Max. She is a wonderfully well-tempered dog, with people than most dogs, but you absolutely do not threaten her, and she'll have you. So, by the time of this camping trip, I had had Parmesan for a few months. She had never come camping with us before, but far as my family are concerned, dogs go on camping trips. So, when we all piled into the car, she came too. Unusually though, none of my family friends could make it, so it was only me, my sister, my dad, and my mom. I didn't mind. I wasn't that attached to the other kids. I would rather play with my dog and I would still have my sister. The drive took the best part of six hours and because we had left a bit later, although I don't remember why we had left later than normal, we arrived at sunset. Not a good time to be building a tent, but we expected to arrive to other campers already set up, and the beach illuminated in campfires. The beach was empty. In spite of this, my parents started taking stuff out and they were trying to build the tent. They asked us to fetch some of the lighter bags from the boot of the car, while they sat pointing a flashlight at the sand to see properly. I rolled down the window of the car for Parmesan before getting out. It was pretty hot for that time of year, and I wanted her to have some air. You always gotta be looking out for my little furry homie. As we're fumbling about in the dark, on a beach in the middle of nowhere, it is pretty spooky. The one road that led to this beach was circular, and had a bridge over the water meaning you could basically circle around the beach like a big zero shape if you felt like it. I wasn't really paying any attention to the road. I was complaining that I was tired, as kids usually are. After maybe 15 minutes of my dad trying to nail the tent into the sand, my mom's asking him had he seen that car drive around. It had been a few times. My dad kind of shrugged her off. He's sort of like that. I don't know if he said anything bad to her, but after a few more minutes, a car pulled up next to ours on the road and someone got out. It was maybe 15 or 20 feet from the cars to where we were, and the light was pretty low, except for the torches. We weren't expecting to see anyone else out here at this point, and I think my mom said that it must be the security. I don't know why a random beach would have security. I think what she meant was the wildlife trust or something, 
as they do occasionally come down to do their nosy work. The guy was walking pretty unevenly. He must have been drunk or high because he had that stagger to him. There was absolutely no way this guy was sober. Cool, a junkie. Not an unusual find, but it's rare to see them out here. As he walked into flashlight range, we realized he was carrying a large knife, maybe 15 inches. Although I was small at the time, so maybe my sense of scale was way off. I don't like my dad, but credit to him, once he saw this, he got up immediately, holding on to the campy mallet, and he put all of us behind him. The man began to shout wildly at us that we can't camp here, and that he was just letting us know. My dad tried to initially be a bit low-key with the guy, and told him that that was fine, that we would leave, but this didn't work. He kept coming closer to us. So my dad started shouting, and the man kept shouting back. My sister and I were crying. I remember shaking. I was utterly terrified, as I'm sure anyone would be in that situation. It really did seem like this guy and my dad were going to fight. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't fancy my dad's chances. While it's grim to consider... I am absolutely convinced he would have killed my dad, and possibly us as well, once he was done, as I don't think my mother would have had the common sense to run with us. I love her, but she's always put dad in her relationship with him above us. This isn't how it went down. A bolt from the black like a wolf descending on its prey took us all by surprise. Most of all, the man with the knife. In that moment, Parmesan was the apex predator large canines that represent in nature. She got him good by the arm and clamped down hard, ripping his jacket and shredding the skin underneath. He dropped the knife as it had been in the arm that she had got him by. He kicked her, he punched her, and he eventually got her off. He grabbed the knife from the sand and ran back to his car and drove off. Parmesan didn't follow him. She stayed with us, muzzle covered in blood. Quickly as we could, we gathered our things and all got back in the car, all pretty shook up by the incident. I looked Parmi over. She was okay, but the car's window was much more open than I had left it. We think that what happened was when the shouting started, she must have put the paw up on the gap that I had left for her. As it was an old car, and it had the roll-down windows and not an electric button, we think that she must have been able to hit it with her paw to force it down enough to squeeze out. And this is not the end of my story, though. We were all pretty scared, and since we had the dog with us, we couldn't book a hotel for the night. My parents just decided to drive home, so we could all feel safe. But first, we had to drive to the nearest town for petrol, as we were kind of low. I spent the time trying to clean Parmesan up a little. I had always loved dogs, but what she had just done for me blew my mind. As we drove into town, we came across a petrol station, but it looked closed. My dad drove up closer to get a better look and stuck his head out the window to get a better look at the sign. My mom asked him what on earth he was doing, and he told her that he was trying to see when it opens. Never. My heart sank. Parked in the corner behind a van, so we hadn't seen him at first, was the man with the knife. He was sitting on the back of his car, using some tissue paper to clean up his arm. It looked pretty bad. Without stopping to refuel or look anywhere else in town, my dad drove right out of there. He decided to go to the next town over, but this was removed. The next town was over 60 miles away. We didn't have enough petrol to get there, we had realized. But we began driving. We were going to break down. That's fine, my dad said. We had AA cover. 
They would come tow us home, or at least, to somewhere acceptable for the night. Better than staying in the last town. After driving for maybe five minutes, lights flash us from behind. Another car. The same car the man had been driving. It was him following us. He must have realized that we were low on petrol. The next half hour was one of the worst half hours of my life. I had a complete and utter breakdown, as did everyone else really. I could tell my parents were trying to keep it under wraps so it wouldn't upset us but we weren't really little kids. We were both double digits by then. We knew how dangerous this situation was. Dad turned off the radio to conserve petrol, and the man followed us for 55 miles before he had peeled away onto another road. Our fuel meter was on the big red E for empty for the last 10 miles. We were driving on fumes. I don't really believe in God, but if he does exist, that was definitely one of his miracles. Once we got there, we drove into a petrol station and we filled to a full tank before driving the rest of the way home. My sister and I had slept after that. I only woke up once when we had made it all the way home. Just grateful nothing worse had happened than that. After getting some sleep, my mom phoned the non-emergency line for the police and reported what had happened. They never got back to her after that, but apparently the woman she spoke to said they may have wished to in the future, as he had matched the description given of a suspect wanted in relation to a murder charge. I have no idea if he was actually the guy or just a random psycho. As I said, they never got back to her. So, what's the takeaway then? Other than a crazy man on the beach and hopefully we don't see them again. Well, for me, it's that I love Parmesan. She's still with us now. Old as the hills and twice as grizzled as one of my mom's friends likes to joke. I don't know why she did what she did that day. I couldn't tell you what her thought process was. What I do know is that this poor puppy was born into an environment where they had abused and neglected her, only to be rescued and taken to a shelter where her mother and siblings all found homes before her. Despite how badly people had treated her, when I took her home, she forgave but never forgot. I think the saying is I never trust a person who doesn't like a dog, but I always trust a dog when they don't like a person. They have a very good understanding of human body language, and I think she must have understood how much danger we were in. If you're able to, please adopt. You might find yourself in a situation like mine one day. I promise you, if you're willing to save a four-legged friend's life, they will pay you back tenfold if they're able to, without a thought for their own safety. I paid 78 pounds for Parmesan's adoption fee, which is a lot when you're a kid, but it chills me to the bone knowing if I hadn't been so instant on the dog, I might be dead. For some more background information, I live in Scotland and this happened in the Highlands, it's fairly remotely. The drive took so long because we always used this one really specific beach and the car was loaded down with camping supplies, two small children and a dog. So the car was heavier than normal, and bathroom breaks were pretty frequent. You've all had to go on the side of the motorway, don't at me. We didn't phone the police while being followed because we had no phone signal, or so my mom said, but I suspect the genuine reason was that there was weed in the car. My parents used to smoke and deal. I didn't include this in the original story because it didn't affect my experience of the story. I was a little kid and I was telling it from my perspective. Regardless, thank you guys all so much. So, me and my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear on 626. And then a day later another friend of ours drove up. And he was supposed to sleep downstairs and the couples would sleep upstairs. Since there were only two bedrooms. The first night that we stayed there it was kind of creepy because 
The cabin was pretty remote. And of course, there's absolutely no lights outside. It is the woods with coyotes howling and bears. But nonetheless, completely normal activity. On the 27th around 12 a.m., my boyfriend are in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door freaking out, saying that he saw shadows in the woods and that the motion light came on and there was a thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend got out of bed and he checked the entire cabin and even went outside. There was nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there is a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out to the woods. It's important to note that I am a naturally very anxious and scared person, while my boyfriend is a rock. He is calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place inside the cabin. So, he pulls the curtain and he jumps and yells, Oh my god! At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180, a CrossFit coach, and to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and he backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside, staring at us. He's just standing in the woods, looking at us. At this point, I think that he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew that he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of the summer and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I am so scared, but try not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes goes by and nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there are five people in a tiny room. And three of them are men, so my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty scared at this point, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. By now, it's around 1.30 in the morning. I told him that I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine and he understands, so we just lay there with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting off to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend. He looks at me. And then the power cuts out. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else was staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact her host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of her phones say no service. We're alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier because his phone had one bar. So he called the local sheriff. I realize now it's a bit of an overreaction, but at the time, we thought we were going to die. He's on the phone with the sheriff and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we are too far into the woods and that they don't cover our area. At this point, we are wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut the power. I cry more and we call 911 to report a suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m. And suddenly the power comes back on. We all fall asleep and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them that our power had went out and he said that was strange and it shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm. He said that he couldn't explain it. I was a stubborn and precocious teen. At age 15, I had a lot of friends but I was a bit of a loner and I enjoyed long walks in nature. Very long walks, sometimes at 10 miles plus. 
Since I couldn't drive yet, I would often just take off from my house and walk on back roads all day long. This was before smartphones. And I was a hundred pound, very tiny girl and my parents probably shouldn't have allowed it. But they have always been very relaxed in their parenting. But like I said, I was stubborn. I also had an unhealthy attitude and invulnerability and naivety. On these walks, people would often pull over and ask me if I needed a ride. The vast majority were men. I never said yes. Usually, I would respond politely with, No thank you, I'm on a walk. And they would leave me alone. Maybe after an, are you sure? And a concerned look at most. This happened literally hundreds of times without incident. However, there was one time that I got a bit lost while walking. Not severely lost, as I could easily backtrack the 5 or 6 miles home. But I had taken a wrong turn and wandered into a very rural area that I had not expected to be in. Whatever, it was a nice day so I kept walking. A guy in his early 30s in a bit of a junky car passed by and asked if I needed a ride, as per usual. I politely declined and he drove on. I got creepy vibes but I didn't think much of it. And then 10 minutes later he pulled up behind me again. This was a rural road and he must have driven in a very large loop to come up behind me again, miles out of the way. He started slowly, driving alongside me while I walked and asked personal questions. My name, my age, where I lived. I didn't tell the truth. He also repeatedly tried to get me to get into his car. I was very uncomfortable and I just wanted him to go away, but I wasn't afraid to be rude. However, I was not getting in his car. After an excruciating five minutes or so of this, Another car came and he was forced to drive off again. I was more annoyed than scared at this point. That good old invulnerable attitude. And then like clockwork, ten minutes later to my horror, I see the car again. This time, he doesn't drive alongside me, but he parks in a pullout a few feet ahead. I don't know what came over me, but instead of panic... My brain just shut down and I became entirely disassociative. I decided to just ignore him. I walked by the car calmly, continuing my walk. I tried not to look at him, but I stole the glance. He was pointing something at me. It was a gun. And before I had time to react or even think, a motorcycle pulled up behind us in part. My stalker seemed extremely panicked by this and peeled out as quickly as possible. I must have looked freaked out because the motorcyclist, who looked like a dad type, was concerned. He asked me if I was okay and if I needed a ride. I gave my usual, no thank you, I'm on a walk and he drove off. I was feeling pretty distrusting at that point and aside from that, I didn't want to climb on a motorcycle with anyone, even though he had saved me from something potentially very bad. Looking back, I owe quite a lot to him. I'm not sure what compelled him to stop, but thank goodness that he did. I then ran the long distance back home, looking over my shoulder the entire way. I never saw the man again. I didn't tell my parents because I was afraid of them restricting my freedom. I still took my long walks, but not again in that area, until a popular nature reserve was open there years later. To start, let me explain myself. I'm 5'7", 113 pounds, and I was 16 at the time of the encounter. I'm a multi-sport athlete. Track, handball, volleyball, basketball, and hockey. And I have insomnia. This all happened around 2am on August 10th of 2019. I had been over to my best friend's place because she had just returned home from a vacation. And she had birthday presents for me. Hoodies and gummies if you're curious. I had spent almost an hour there already and wanted to head back home soon because honestly, my town is scary at night and drug dealers and a lot of really bad people. You know the deal. So I waved goodbye to my best friend and started walking down her street. 
I guess a party had just let up because behind me at the end of the road, about 20 or 30 yards from where I was standing, there were a couple of men walking across the crosswalk. They were both pretty tall, I'm guessing between 5'11 and 6'3. The two seemed harmless at first when I looked in their direction, but soon they came to a stop. They were both looking at me. At this point I felt uncomfortable, so I just kept walking, and that's when I overheard what one of them had said. Hey, that's a girl. At this, I whipped my head around. They were starting to walk in my direction now, and one of the two men had moved over towards the sidewalk where there was no light. I knew at this point that something wasn't right, and I began to pick up my pace. They were still getting closer. I didn't know where the second guy was, but when I looked back, the first guy was still following me down the middle of the road. I think that they were planning to cut me off and try to trap me between the two of them. The minute I was about 13 yards from the T intersection, I started to run and that's when the yelling had started. Oh great, now she's running. My hooked a sharp right and then a left. I could still hear them behind me, and at this point all I knew was that I could not stop moving. I had to lose them somehow. I was coming up to an apartment building with a small parking lot behind it. There were no lights. I made the split second decision to veer off into the parking lot, and I squeezed myself under one of the cars. I don't know how long that I waited there. It could have been a minute, but it felt like a lifetime. I watched the two men run past. They didn't bother to check under the cars, which was definitely in my favor. The minute that I felt that I was safe, I backtracked and took a different route back to my home. I was too scared to take the main way, in the fear that I would have bumped into them. I know what I'm about to say is stupid, but I didn't go to the police. I wouldn't have been able to give a proper description of the men, because I hadn't seen their faces. If there is anything I learned from my experience, it's that no matter who you are, you need to be extremely careful. You can think that the part of town or city that you live in is safe, but that really isn't the case. There is no protective barrier to keep out people with bad intentions. Please, whatever you do, watch your surroundings as if your life depends on it. If I had been listening to my music and not paying attention, I hate to think what could have happened to me. I hope that no one else has to experience the fear that I did. It was almost like prey being chased by predators. Back in 2015 when I was in my second semester of college as a freshman, I had a habit of pacing around to keep my thoughts coming. I had had this habit since childhood and it often seemed that I couldn't stay focused on anything that required creative thought without it. Considering my intended major required literature and creative writing courses, it was something that I found myself doing constantly. Especially when I was trying to think up ideas for essays and narratives assigned in class. To be clear, my pacing just isn't walking. It needs to be done along a predictable short route. So I can mentally clock out of reality and focus solely on my thoughts while I run on autopilot. I often put in headphones to prevent distractions that take me back into reality. Because if that happens amid thought pattern... I'll lose at least half of the ideas that I was exploring. It's weird, I know, but I wanted to clarify this now because I've had people ask me why I just don't go for a long walk around the neighborhood instead of walking around in circles in my backyard like I normally do. It was getting late one evening, and I had a lengthy essay due the day after next. I had a good portion of it done already, but I still had a bit to go. My roommate had come back to the dorm, and considering the time it was, perfectly understandable that she wanted to sleep. She generally didn't mind my pacing, but preferred that I didn't do it when she was trying to rest. It's also understandable. And with her turning the lights off in the room, it would be a little difficult for me anyway. I still wanted to keep going on this assignment though, so I decided to find somewhere else on campus outside the room to pace, 
and figured I would note down ideas in an app on my phone as needed for later. There was nowhere in the dorm complex that was suitable, so I started walking around. The university was well known for its large campus, so I figured I would find a good place eventually. I walked for a bit until I found myself at one of the more historic buildings, which had a nice courtyard in front of it. Part of this courtyard included wide pedestrian paths that met in the center, as a nice roundabout with a fountain in the middle. A little further from that was another small roundabout with a grass island in the center. A circular paths like that are ideal for my pacing, because I don't have to stop and turn around repeatedly, and I ended up choosing to walk around the one with the grass island, so I wouldn't disturb anyone who wanted to hang out by the fountain. Some people are a bit unnerved by my pacing, so I worried it might freak out a stranger who saw me on a late night walk. There was the occasional passerby, but for the most part, the place was empty at this time of night. I figured I could go in circles for a bit without disturbing anyone. I put on my headphones. Yes, both of them, and yes, I'm aware that was a poor decision, given these circumstances, but I was exhausted. And I just wanted to get the brainstorming session over with so I could go to sleep. I started to walk in circles with my music playing as my mind drifted. I don't know how long I was pacing before the encounter, but it wasn't long. As I was rounding once more, I was met by headlights from a car driving slowly up the path to this roundabout. I was a little confused by this, as I was sure the path was meant for pedestrian traffic only. But since it was deserted, save for me, I just assumed that the driver needed an easy way to turn around and didn't think it was a big deal since the risk of accidentally hitting someone was a next to zero. The vehicle passed me while I moved closer to the center to keep me from being in the way, and I kept my eyes on it while I walked. I expected the car to just go around and back down the path that it came from, since that was the only path on the roundabout that led back to the street. But instead, it came to a stop on the side of the roundabout opposite the street. While I initially started to assume then that they needed to look at their GPS or make a phone call before continuing, there was no denying the uneasy feeling I got about the situation. Instead of continuing my round route, which would have taken me right alongside the vehicle, I decided to take one of the paths toward the building and just wait for them to move on. While I walked, I noticed an empty parking lot on the other side of the building. The path didn't go there, but it was easy to walk over the grass patch dividing the two areas. I started to pace in the lot for a bit, and I quickly forgot about returning to the roundabout as I got lost in my thoughts again. I was pulled back into reality by the shine of semi-distant headlights. It was the same car from before, or at least it looked eerily similar. Luckily, I was facing the entrance to the lot as it turned in and said entrance was a decent distance for me. I started to hear quiet alarm bells in the back of my mind, even as my rational side tried to assume that it must be a different car, and just an odd coincidence, and perhaps I was just paranoid. Regardless of the mental attempt to explain it away, I felt it was better safe than sorry. I ended up walking around the other side of the building to get back to the little roundabout that I was at before. I took a breath and I calmed my nerves a little with some half-hearted reassurances before walking on the roundabout again. This time, I didn't turn my music back on, but I kept my headphones in. They weren't noise cancelling at all, so I could hear decently through them when the music was paused. I wanted to go back to brainstorming but felt somewhat anxious and panicky at the thought of it. So, I kept pacing like I had been, this time focused on the very much aware of what was going on around me. I thought that maybe once 10 or 15 minutes had gone by without incident, I'd be able to calm down and get the last of this done. Barely 5 minutes had passed when I heard the obvious sound of rubber tires coming up the path again. This time when I looked... I was certain it was the same car and that it had followed me back here from the parking lot. I didn't know what the driver had wanted with me. They never honked, rolled down windows, or anything to try and get my attention. 
but I realized at that point that, as a 19-year-old girl alone at night anymore, secluded area of campus, I had been extremely lucky so far, and that luck wouldn't last forever. This time, I speed walked through the grass. There's a pedestrian-only, arch-like bridge that goes over a busy major street that runs through campus. Most of the dorms like mine are on one side of the bridge, while lecture halls and class buildings are on the other. And while I normally hated this bridge because of how steep it was, it was closer than the nearest street crossing right then. I didn't have a wait time to cross it, and there was no chance of a vehicle following me up. I felt much more at ease from the top of it, and from there, I saw the car drive off, seemingly calling it a night. I walked back to my dorm, and by the time I reached my door, the adrenaline had worn off and I was exhausted. I went in quietly to not wake my roommate, laid in bed without even changing into pajamas, and I fell asleep. I never contacted campus police about the matter or anything, because I didn't have any helpful information, other than a four-door car that could have been black or dark blue for all I know, and it didn't seem like I'd be believed anyway. I never saw the vehicle again or heard anything that related to it in any way, so over time, it slipped my mind altogether. I still don't know what the driver had planned, or why they didn't just get out of the car and come after me on foot at any point. Maybe it was the first time that they were trying this, and they were nervous about making a scene or getting caught. Maybe it was just some college assholes messing with me, because they thought it was fun to scare people like that. Whatever it was, I'm glad I didn't have to find out the hard way, and I never paced in public areas after dark on that campus again. So, this happened to me about eight years ago. I used to work at a tobacconist when I was 18. My first job after graduating high school, but not my first job in retail. The staff there were hired as casual employees, but on full-time hours. I got the job at the time because I was young and that meant I was cheap labor. But the pay was pretty decent and I was job hunting. And took the first job I was offered so I could move out of home. When I first started there, there were four of us employed. Two of us would be on shift at a time with a one hour handover. The open hours were from 8am to 6pm. I was happy doing the closing shifts because I wasn't a morning person. A couple of months into my employment, the company decided to change their business hours during weekdays from 8am to 8pm, with one 9pm on late night shopping. This upped my hours so more money, and of course, I was put on a couple closing shifts a night, with rotation between me and another worker, but only one person would stay at the shop from 6pm. I was a little bit iffy about this because I lived in a sketchy suburb in a sketchy town. The later that it got in the night, the more the undesirables were abundant. Our laws prohibit us from carrying protection and at the time, I didn't drive so I relied on buses or taxis as transport. Taxis weren't reliable here. You'd call one and they wouldn't chill or make you wait an hour or so. I stuck with buses because I knew they would arrive. Uber wasn't an option then. There was a transit bus stop one minute away from my work. One scheduled to leave about five minutes before our closing time. Now I tried to negotiate to my boss to close a little early, but he wasn't open to the idea. You can catch a cab, he offered. Yeah, I could, but that's not guaranteed. Now I usually got them on my 9pm shift, so my routine was to stay until closing and wait 30-40 minutes for the next bus. As practice, I would wait in the closed store until 5 minutes before bus arrived, and then I would walk in and wait by the stop. So, one night, I shut shop, hung out a bit inside with the lights on so the shopping center security knows that I'm still there, and I head out to the bus stop at 8.30pm. I was relieved to see that there were about six other people waiting at the stop. As I'm standing there waiting for the bus, a guy in his 30s or 40s who is visibly intoxicated and on other stuff, who knows what, approaches me. Where are you headed? Home. Can I come home with you? I shake my head no. He then takes a step closer and he is so close that I could smell and feel his breath in my face. 
Automatically, I step back so I'm not out of my comfort zone and try to walk closer to other people. A regular customer that I liked could see me and tried to start up a conversation to get me out of talking to this creep, but the creep got real pissed at this. He got intimidating and told me to look at him when he's talking to me. He was smiling in a way that made me feel sick, and my whole body suddenly rushed with adrenaline. I tried to say that I'm not talking to you, but he just kept trying to get closer to me and insisted that we're going home together. Thankfully, the buses finally started to arrive and I started feeling relieved hoping this guy would get on one before me. Nope. He lingers and asks what bus I'm getting on. There was no way that I was going to tell him what bus I was getting on. If it was the same one as me, I was going to catch a different one. Well, he told me that he's getting on mine and my heart sank. My bus was the last in line so everyone was piling onto theirs. And I was about to be left alone with this guy. And I knew that he would follow me. If I tried to call the cops on the bus, would he become aggressive? I was already in. How the heck do I get out of this mode? Just as my bus pulls up and opens the doors, the transit security pulls up behind and rush out of the car yelling at the creep. We told you to move on from here. The creep starts cussing and yelling, but he walks away. The security guys ask if I'm alright, and I just nod and jump on the bus before it pulls away. I'm so grateful they arrived when they did, and I dread to think what could have happened if this man did follow me home. When I was in high school, probably about 9th or 10th grade, my best friend had a boyfriend that was older and lived fairly far away. So, he was not from our school or anything. Not sure how she met him. Anyway, when she would spend the night at my house or we would go to the mall or to go see a movie, he would often stalk us. We would be in my house and he would drive by slowly. And keep in mind, he lived nowhere near there. So, it was a no accident. This was while they were dating. I think he wanted to check up on her to see if she was cheating on him or not. He would look to see if my car was at my house. One time, we were at an amusement park that was local. And he just happened to show up there. My friend, bless her heart, was kind of dumb and naive. So she honestly thought it was some random accident that he showed up at the amusement park while we were there. I obviously knew that it was intentional. It was pretty annoying that she and I could not do anything without him showing up or following us. I used to talk to him, and he told me that he wanted to poke holes in their condom so he could get her pregnant, so that she would never leave him. I told her what he said, and... She still continued to sleep with him. Finally, she got some sense and decided that she wanted to break up with him. Well, that did not go well. She had a grandmother that was elderly and was in early stages of dementia at the time. She lived alone, but only a few minutes from my friend so they could keep an eye on my grandmother and take care of her. Well, apparently, this crazy boyfriend started visiting the elderly grandmother pretty often on his own. No one knew he was doing this. Since she was just a confused old woman, she was saying all kinds of things to her and trying to manipulate her. It worked to the point that the grandmother thought he was a great guy, and that my friend and her mom and stepdad were awful for treating him so badly. The grandmother had some kind of episode where she was yelling at my friend's parents about it and everything. It got to the point that they had to take out a restraining order on my friend and the grandmother, so he could no longer approach either of them. I'm not a scaredy cat, but I was getting a little nervous myself, because he did know where I lived, and he knew I was probably one of the ones encouraging her to break up with him. I worried that he might try to retaliate against me. But luckily for everyone involved, he took a hint and stayed away. But that is a truly shady tactic to manipulate an innocent old woman with dementia and in turning on her own daughter and granddaughter and confusing the poor old woman.
Just a warning everyone, this story has some controversial topics. Please read with care. So, to start at this story, I was at best friends with a girl named Charlie for three years. I loved her and I thought that she loved me, but that wasn't true. Fifth grade at primary school. Back in fifth grade, I had just been transferred to a new school. The whole class knew each other from the year before and I was a complete outcast. I met Charlie at the school's open house and apparently we sat at the same table. She was really nice and bubbly and said that she would like to get to know me. I wanted a friend and she was there. Sparing the details of awkward preteens trying to get through school, we became fast friends. We got each other's Skype and we talked day and night. We called nearly every day and would just talk for hours. She made me laugh and we could talk about anything. I also became friends with Charlie's friends, Catherine and Addison. We were a group of kids and we had fun. But things changed subtly over time. Charlie became more depressed, mentioning that she had been diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. I did my best to comfort her. What are her friends for? I assured her that this didn't change anything, and it's a good thing that she was getting help for the issues. She agreed, but I don't think she really believed it. I'm not entirely sure when it started, but Charlie started venting to me about her emotions. I would always listen and try to help when I could find the words. I was her shoulder to cry on, and I was happy that I could help her in some way. I felt like repaying her for picking up the new nobody who wandered into her friend group. She never got better though. She started to get more extreme and more serious breakdowns. She would call herself worthless, claiming that she could tell her parents hated her. I had met her parents by that point and they were loving people. They clearly cared about her and I told her so. She called me a liar, saying that I should just leave her to self-destruct and stop pretending that I care. I was heartbroken and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The next day at school she seemed to be doing better, smiling and joking with her friends. I tried to ask her about the night before. But she got a very serious look on her face and she sounded angry, telling me that it doesn't matter anymore. I didn't pry, figuring that she would talk about it later. That night, I asked her again, but I got a similar answer from before. I was confused but just went with it. I wish I hadn't. It went for months like that. Her breaking down, uh, spiraling, calling me a liar, a cheat, and saying that I hated her guts. Any attempt to comfort her or deny the accusations were met with a liar. It became a routine. Charlie broke the routine by adding uh, something new. She started to openly hurt herself in school. When she would mess up, answer a question wrong, or sometimes for no reason... She would take a mechanical pencil and start scratching her arm, holding it just to show me and her friends exactly what she was doing. Whenever we would try to stop her, she would snap at us, saying to stop pretending we care and to shut up or to don't touch me. We didn't know what to do. We were just kids. The summer after fifth grade went pretty well. We seemed to be getting a bit better with less spiraling and breakdowns. We talked every day, and before we knew it, the summer was over. Sixth grade, middle school. We were a year older and in a new school. We were still the group, me, Charlie, Catherine, and Addison. This is when Charlie got worse again. She started having breakdowns during school, and she would openly hurt herself more. I was constantly worried for her. I don't think there was a full day that whole year that I could relax and not worry about her hurting herself. If memory serves correctly, I have a lot of trouble remembering these years in detail. It was the year that she first messaged me saying that she wanted to really hurt herself. She explained how she would do it, and how easy it would be, 
and tell him I won't care that she was gone. I was crying hysterically trying to calm her down and say how much I cared about her and how I didn't know what I would do without her. She ended the conversation saying that she wouldn't do it. I was beyond relieved and made sure to check up with her the next day at school. She insisted that it wasn't that bad and that I had overreacted. I still insisted that she be honest about those feelings and tell him Dalt if she was really thinking about that. Charlie promised that she would. And the rest of the year remained pretty consistent, with a steady incline in severity of her breakdowns, but slow enough that I hardly noticed the change. Seventh grade. This was the year everything really hit the fan. This year is very fuzzy in my memory, so I'll just have to hit the main points. Charlie was starting to struggle in school. When she was immediately graded something she gave up, she would stop trying. The open self-harm got worse, going as far as to shout at me if I tried to stop her. But she was still my best friend. I loved her and she loved me, right? We could talk to each other about anything. Except when I tried to vent to her, she would say that I was making it all about me, or that she couldn't handle it right then. If she was having trouble and I'd tried to relate to her issues and give advice, she would say that I was making it about myself and that I'm not her parent. This year, I started to really question my gender. I met my actual best friend and my now platonic partner, Liz. We were two broken trans kids so deep in the closet that we couldn't admit that we were trans. Liz was the first to come out, and I welcomed her with open arms gushing about how much stuff we could do together. Charlie didn't like Liz. She was clearly jealous and thought Liz was taking me from her. I reassured her that I still cared about her and that she was still my number one, but she didn't believe me. About the middle of the school year, Charlie said that she might have a crush on me and she asked if I would be opposed to being her romantic partner. At the time, I was very in denial about my sexuality and said that I wouldn't mind it. She seemed to take this as me consenting to some kind of relationship. She became much more touchy hugging me and even kissed my head or forehead a few times. I didn't know why at the time. These actions made me incredibly uncomfortable and I wanted to shrivel up and hide. I now know it's because I'm touch averse, but at the time, I hated myself for these reactions. I beat myself up inside for recoiling from my best friend, and how dare I get grossed out. I very quickly fessed up to the discomfort, telling her that I didn't actually want to date her, that we weren't together, and that I wasn't comfortable with the amount of physical contact she was giving. She seemed understanding apologizing for being touchy, and even joking a bit about being touch-starved. At that, she started to get really distant when we were in person, and not just physical distance. She seemed to avoid talking to me for long, and made any excuse to shut me off. The nightly routine of a breakdown Russian roulette or whether it be a couple sentences or four hours continued. There were a few different times that she had threatened to really hurt herself, and more than once, she said it would be my fault. One particular standout night, she sent me a video. There was Charlie sitting in her bathroom next to the toilet. It would be so easy for me to just end it. I could drown myself in the toilet and no one would know. It'd be quiet and no one would care. My parents don't give a crap. I texted her over and over again, begging for her to not do it, saying that I loved her, her parents loved her, and that I'd miss her. I cried so much that I got dehydrated. I stayed up past midnight, just waiting for her to respond, but she didn't, and I thought that she was gone. I thought that she had really did it, and it was my fault. That I should have gotten to her sooner. I cried myself to sleep that night. When I got to school, I saw her walking into class and my heart nearly leapt out of my chest. I ran up and I hugged her. 
I wept and begged for an answer, asking where she had been, saying that I thought she was gone. She chuckled. Geez, sorry, I forgot to check my phone last night. I felt like everything stopped. I just stared at her. This person who I had loved for years now, who I looked after, talked to, cared for, and couldn't live without, just laughed about it. I didn't know what to say. I was so dumbfounded that I just tried to act normal. My whole view of her shattered that day, and it was the beginning of the end. That year droned on, and I slowly started to push away from Charlie. I still cared deeply for her, but I couldn't take it anymore. Her breakdowns and ramblings and venting was daily, and I just couldn't handle her berating me. I felt terrible, like I was abandoning her. It felt like leaving a person with a broken foot to walk a thousand stairs themselves, but I had to get away. I started talking to our mutual friends about what she did and was doing. They said that it was terrible and couldn't believe she would say such things. I showed them the conversations, feeling even more guilty for showing off our private text to other people. I had to prove it though. I had to make them believe me. In the end, I did get away from Charlie. I think my other friends did too, but they didn't do much for me. They shut me out and while I was broken, healing from a three year long wound. They talked about me behind my back, added fuel to my fire, only to tell me that I only ever talk about Charlie. I lost about all my friends that year. Now I tried to resettle back into my group of friends at first, but it wasn't the same as before. I was constantly worried that they were talking about me behind my back and I was terrified that they saw me to be on the same level as Charlie. And so, I left that group. It was for the best in the end. It's been a few years now, and I can say with certainty that I have trauma from all those years. This post is by no means detailed enough to capture the horrific experience that was my time as a Charlie's friend, but I don't want to reopen old wounds. I am still great friends with Liz, and she honestly saved me from Charlie's reign of terror. Her kindness and friendship contrasted with Charlie's everything woke me up to how awful it was. I don't hate Charlie, despite all that she did to me. She was a terrible person and an absolute monster of a human, but we were just kids. I know that I'm not the same person I was back then and I figure that she isn't either. Everyone deserves a second chance in life, but Charlie, let's never meet again. Just an update to add a little more detail to the story. Charlie was on antidepressants starting in the summer post fifth grade. She often blamed her outburst on her unfit medication, or stating that I forgot to take my meds. I later found out that she had been lying. Her parents ensured she took her medication at the right time each night, and her forgetting was a complete lie, used to excuse her actions. Later in the timeline of abuse, 7th grade, she would say things like, Don't even try, she'll be back soon, referring to herself during a mental spiral or a breakdown as a different person. This is also when she started to claim to not remember doing the things she did during breakdowns. I know for a fact that she was lying about this, because in private, she would admit to remembering and say how she's not really two different people. Every time, it was just used as excuses for her to be a horrible person. More often than not, she told me it would be my fault if she really did it. If I left her, whatever she did to herself afterwards would be my fault. And if I stopped being her friend, it would prove her right. And so I stayed. Those few nights that she stopped talking abruptly, I was horrified that she had did it, and it would be all my fault. 
and I thought that her parents would get mad at me, screaming and crying at me for doing this to her daughter. But that day never came. I got out. I escaped her iron grip. And I have never been more thankful for having true friends who love me. I truly don't know where I would be now if I had stayed. During 8th grade, she was still in my school. We had the same math class each morning and I did everything possible to ignore her. Sometimes I would see her in the hallway or at lunch and I just couldn't bring myself to look at her. At one point, we were outside on break and she was right next to me, but uh, I couldn't look at her face. I had felt like if I were to look, my eyes would burn, like looking directly at the sun. It would be easy to hate her for everything she did to me and others, but hatred only breeds contempt. I do hope that she has found a better life, but I dearly hope for my sake that we never meet again. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep in my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I figured she was weirded out that I didn't wake her sooner so I kicked myself for being a creep and I went on with my day. I can't win them all. I was thrown for a heck of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized that I hadn't asked her name. I'm hard on hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name. Lucy, right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say, she was overwhelmingly forward after a few weeks, and I got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak and finding out about my personal life. I'm a serial overshare, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in by saying how messed up things were and that she would kick my friend's butt for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even at 16, I knew that was cringy and I was going through my emo phase. The thing that really bugged me at the time was that she would ask so much about me, but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel really crappy always venting and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days and I let another girl sit by me since. It was an overcrowded bus and I didn't think it mattered. When Lucy came back and saw me with another girl, you would think that she was shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember what exactly Lucy said, but... The other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her rival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while, things started getting hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities and anytime I got upset about it, she would give me crap for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped, just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy wasn't breaking me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time that she hit me. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory. Some kind of cinematic moment in my life. Honestly, it all just blended together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and playful slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive until she had slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a crappy joke and she shoved me hard into the wall. She laughed because of the sound that I made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us but they didn't do anything. 
Sometimes I wonder what they thought of me. I didn't dump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right or it was an honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every time I did, she had a new sob story. I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get to my head that she was some tragic soul that I could help her. I convinced myself there was something noble about taking the abuse and nobody I knew tried to step in and stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three week span. First, I found out that she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. It felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way that she showed me was worse. She seemed excited like I would be happy that she had invaded my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. After about a half hour on my chest of not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at her stop and she had to get up. But she looked me in the eye and told me that she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it or anything, just... I pretend to sleep on you sometimes. Like, what the hell? The breaking point came when she was showing off some award that she got from school. There was something off about the award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had a name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem was, it wasn't addressed to Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out that I didn't even know my girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights and I broke things off. Lucy was always the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and just stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop. I felt like she wanted to know that she was watching me. One day when she got on the bus, she looked me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to her new seat. I'm pretty sure that she was expecting me to say something to her. The next year I graduated and I got a retail job. The end of the story, right? I thought so too. It was the start of Christmas season and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store that I was working at by random chance. It had been a year and a half since we had broke up at this point so I wasn't happy to see her. But surely we could pretend that it wasn't weird. She gave me the look the squirrel in Ice Age gives his knot. She grabbed something from the front and went right into my line. She didn't say a word to me but she wouldn't break eye contact. And she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt to look at her. I rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support and he told me that she was giving her weird vibes. I got this really bad gut feeling after she had left. Lucy became a regular in our little shop. She would come in and creep up my coworkers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came while ringing her out and she said that she was visiting me. She didn't say my name, but she described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite complaints because the managers were very penny-pinching, who would sell any one of us out to get sales of. I knew Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard how often she came. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth a minimum wage. The last time that I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff that we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance, so you could see right in from the store proper. I left to put up the stuff in my cart, and when I came back, I saw her. She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance, still as a statue. 
I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours before her. She suddenly turned and walked away briskly. The girl that I was talking to was still in the back when I got back. She was a lot more awkward after that. The girl quit three days later and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I would like to think that it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I don't know. I left the store not too long after that and got a job that didn't involve customer service. That wasn't the last time that I saw her, though. The last time I saw Lucy was uh, last week. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for dinner. I thought that I saw her online, but I convinced myself that it was someone else. I ordered and sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate and she took the table between me and the window that I was looking out. She was some guy that looked vaguely similar, maybe a school friend. She was sat at an angle so she was half looking at him and every few seconds she would look right at me. I know that it was her. She had changed her hair and it looked an awful lot like mine now. After I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with a company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hadn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she'll turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up. Lucy has been a part of my life for the last four years. We dated for four months in high school and she keeps turning up. I was a date paragon of mental health before I met her. But I feel like she broke me as a person and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I've developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous leaving my house. And people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. I've tried to date since everything happened, but I just can't. It's too much work at this point, so I've decided that I'll stay single until I can work through my issues. But I'm begging you, Lucy, just leave me alone. This was 2015. I wasn't really actively looking, but I would pop on to OkCupid every few weeks to see if anything interesting was in my inbox. Being a female, I had a very active inbox. Sorry, guys. And I noticed an email from an interesting, fairly local guy. The email was alright, which I don't mind talking about if the person asking is sincerely interested and respectful. And we got to chatting. I had zero romantic or sexual interest, but thought this could be a relationship, a friendship. After a few months of chatting, he found me on the Book of Faces, asking if it was okay to send an ad request, and I agreed. We had been chatting and getting along well, and he seemed like a nice person. A little weird, but that's okay, because I'm a little weird myself. No big deal. We continue to chat here and there for about two years. He sends me birthday greetings, just a casual friendship. He had asked several times to me to hang out, etc. I've considered it, but at that time, I was running my own business and working up to 70 hours a week, plus maintaining my own home, raising my younger child, older as an adult, and trying to balance two partners in an extremely needy, demanding, workaholic client who had no boundaries. 11pm phone calls occurred without a note of hesitation or remorse on vacation. So, uh, we meet up never occurred, but we kept in touch online. Late last year, a news story broke out about a man and his girlfriend taking advantage of and killing her younger teenage daughter. I never connected the name until a friend contacted me and said, Oh, I see you're friends with this guy. Did you see the news? The news stories all use his full legal name, not his nickname. Think Richard vs. Dick, which is why I never connected the two. It was him. My then online friend of two years had done these horrible things to his girlfriend's teenage daughter with the girlfriend's help. He's made several statements since then, stating that he always had this fantasy 
and that this child was asking for it, and that it wasn't fun, murdering her, and he apparently thought it would be. It still sends chills down my spine. I dodged a bullet, big time. Be safe out there. You never know who was on the other side of that keyboard or phone call. And my skin still crawls thinking about this guy. He saw me shopping for school supplies and things for my new apartment one evening during my first week of grad school and decided that I was his mark. I had just moved to my new college town. Didn't even have a cell phone yet after leaving the one my folks paid for during undergrad behind. I was grown and I could take care of myself. What a nitwit I was. As I left the parking lot with my purchases, I noticed this truck pull up behind me at the exit. It was late and there weren't too many people out. I pulled out and so did he. It was a few miles down a long retail street with lots of stoplights before my turn. As I drove, I realized the guy in the truck was trying to get my attention. I was in a relationship, so I ignored him. Over the next few miles, he kept trying to get me to look at him. Some red lights he would end up ahead of me, some behind or beside. At every light, he positioned himself so he could stare at me, either directly or in one of his mirrors. His gaze was unwavering, and my anxiety rose. He was driving oddly, speeding up close to my bumper, hitting his brakes when he was in front of me, swerving close to my car a couple of times. Finally, at a red light, where he was beside me, I glanced over and absolutely started to panic. When I was met with an unbelievably empty, unwavering stare, and realized that he was fiddling with himself, he was getting off on the fact that I was terrified. He was following me, and he was trying to force me to pull over. At one point, I scooted through an intersection on a hard yellow a couple of cars ahead of him, thinking that I could shake him. Nope. He went right around the cars at the light and ran the red and got back in front of me. A freeway entrance ramp came up and I tried to fake him out by putting on my signal and getting into the emerge lane for it. He took the bait and started up the ramp. I quickly got out of the merge lane and continued straight. Again, I would hope that I would lose him but he drove his truck down the embankment to keep following. At another light where he was beside me, I pulled through the light and then turned at the last possible second. He made a U-turn and ran another red to follow me. My panic really ramped up at that point. With no cell phone, no sense of direction in a new city, I really didn't know what to do. So I turned on classic rock and forced myself to sing along, and forced myself to go the speed limit, so I wouldn't crash out of terrified stupidity. I decided to drive to the supermarket across town, because I remembered it had a police station in it. He followed me all the way there. He burned out of a lot as soon as he saw all the cop cruisers parked out front. I filed a report and asked for a police escort home. I insisted because something told me this creep was waiting for me to leave the police station. And he was. As soon as I pulled out, I saw him. I pulled over and told the officer following me, and he went after him, but the truck had taken off and the cop couldn't catch him. The police got the surveillance video from the first door. It turned out this jerk had been dogging me the entire time that I was shopping. I saw him on footage following me through the store. I saw him follow me out, close enough to grab my elbow. I saw footage of him circling the lot in his truck waiting for me to pull out when I took too long to unload my cart. My heart sank. I was able to remember 627 digits of his plate and the make and model of his truck. But in the end, the cops did nothing. They said that it was a he said, she said, since the surveillance video didn't catch him doing anything unlawful, and was a losing case to try to charge him with anything. I ended up trading vehicles with a friend for a couple of months. To try to feel safer and I went on with my life. I had no idea what this disgusting piece of crack did. Just a handful of months later until 
almost 15 years had passed. I was watching a Discovery ID show about the kidnapping and murder of Sandy Jeffers. I almost fell out of my seat when I saw the mugshot of her killer, Aaron Lee Skeen. It was him. I was so disgusted that law enforcement did nothing in my case that I tracked down the investigator in the murder case and, after verifying some things about his vehicle that were changed in the TV reenactment to weed out people making crap up, she took my contact info and official statement. She could neither confirm nor deny that my run-in was with Skeen, but qualified her statement by saying, at least you don't have to worry about him anymore because he got life without parole. I only wish something could have been done when he had terrorized me. Perhaps things would have been different for Sandy. So yeah, creepy murderous stalker crazy dude. Let's not ever meet again. A few years ago, I reconnected with an old acquaintance on social media. It started slow, he would like things that I posted every now and then, which grew to him liking almost everything over the course of a few months. I took it as a cue that he liked me, but I was too shy to make a move. It was cute, but not something that I paid much attention to. He would post cryptic lyrics and we didn't have much in common. Around the same time, I started to get that cliche feeling that I was being watched. For reference, at the time I lived in a house in the woods, it would be very easy to hide in the bushes. Our lawnmower wasn't the best, but it worked. You could adjust the height of the grass and somehow that mechanism broke while my brother was out mowing the lawn. So we ended up with some weird patches of bald grass. No big deal. Later that night though, I saw a post from that old acquaintance about patterns in the grass. It seemed like a song lyric, but I couldn't find a song that matched up with it. I didn't think anything of it until I was outside the next day, and realized our lawn had some strange patterns after that mishap. I, being a big old paranoid weirdo, got a bit freaked out. I tried to calm myself down. It was probably nothing, right? Plus, what could I even do? It proved nothing. A few nights later, I had the same creepy feeling in, so I went out on our porch. It's large and there's no easy way to sneak up. We are partially earth berm, so it runs along the second story, and the edge is mostly in the air or it's fenced, so I felt safe. I waited, uh, listening for anything, and then I sort of just started yelling, like he was there. I said that I thought he was really creepy. I talked about all the terrible things I would do to him if he ever made the mistake of coming near me, and then I went back inside. I know that it sounds dumb, but then he unfollowed me from all social media, stopped liking everything that I posted and left me alone. And when I went to his profile, he had deleted that song lyric about the patterns in the grass. Maybe it was all completely coincidental, and that's what I would like to believe. Maybe he finally got sick of my ramblings and that just happened to coincide with my speech. Or maybe he was out there in the woods watching and listening. This happened around 2011 when I was still in high school. At the time, I really enjoyed PC gaming and eventually I started getting into a specific MMORPG. I wasn't really very good at it, but I wasn't playing to make friends or anything only joining parties when absolutely necessary. For a few months, I just logged on and played some quests and did the usual thing. Because it was so long ago, excuse me that I can't remember all the game-specific terminology. Now, if I remember correctly, the game worked as follows. Some areas like cities or towns were public spaces, so when you were there you would be able to interact with other people, also currently there in their respective gameplay. If someone wasn't actually in your party, you would have no contact with them when entering into a private space outside. One day when moving about in one of the public areas, I was approached by another player. We'll call him Andrew, just chatting to me. He was friendly and I didn't really any sense any red flags. It was a very standard interaction, but also probably 
one of my first that wasn't quest related. Andrew was friendly and offered to help me with whatever I needed to do in the game next. At some point, he just randomly asked me whether I was really a girl. My avatar was female, but my username didn't really offer any information relating to my gender. So I confirmed, albeit confused, that I am a girl. And that seemed to be it. When we continued on from there, did the quest, and after adding him as a friend, I logged off eventually. Everything seemed fine. A few days later, I played again and with what I assume must have been my newfound confidence in my friend-making skills thanks to Andrew. I did a quest with some other people who offered to let me join their guild. I was sort of stoked because I've never had a guild offer before. So I immediately accept and join their guild. Even though it was tiny and unimportant, I was happy. The next day I log on and Andrew was also online. The game publicly showed your guild affiliation and he immediately angry, I guess. He reprimands me that I shouldn't just join any guild and demands that I leave it because he wanted me to join his guild instead. I'm very confused but I feel like I've somehow betrayed my friend. So I do as he asked and accept his invitation to join his guild. Though I felt bad for just immediately dropping my previous guild, I do cheer up a bit when I note that Andrew's guild is rated insanely high. The next time I log on is where things start getting weird. Just to clarify, I had never exchanged any personal information with Andrew. All he knew about me is that I identify as a female. Not only did I value my privacy in game, and had never exchanged personal information with anyone on there. I had never posted on any public forum about the game, never joined a game-related group, and I hadn't even liked it on Facebook. As far as I know, there is no way to link me to my account. But I log in and Andrew greets me in chat by my full name and surname. Now, my username was not related to my actual name, and I had never told him anything personal about myself including my name and surname, so I was confused. However, I assume perhaps since I haven't been playing that long, I just didn't totally understand the mechanisms of the game, and perhaps my name was available somewhere. His message has become weirder and more evasive. I remember him specifically saying, I can't live not knowing what it feels like to touch your skin followed by many messages of him speculating what I must feel and smell like. I log off and have no idea what to do. As stupid as I am, I decide to try and freak him out. So, I do some snooping of my own. I remember all I did was look up the guild Facebook group, and I think he was one of the admins. He was the guild leader, I believe so, it wasn't so hard. At the point, I didn't know his full name yet either but it was easy to figure out. Let's say that his username in game was Ancrew, just one letter off from the admin called Andrew. Next time that I logged back into the game, he was online as well. Once again he greets me by my full name and surname. I respond with the same sense I now know what his name and surname is. However, he is unfazed. He responds by asking me how things were in my neighborhood and at my school, by naming them both. He knows where I live and where I go to school. I immediately logged off, uninstalled the game, and I've never been back. I still don't know how he got that information since it wasn't publicly available anywhere. I still have his full name and surname and checked his Facebook a while back out of sheer curiosity. He's a professor at a university of science and technology. This story has a lot of build-up. So, I met this friend online the summer before my junior year of high school. I was 16. His name was Flip, and we clicked pretty much instantly. Our senses of humor matched up and I felt like we were really good friends. He was a guy, I was a girl, and I never really held romantic feelings. Also, I was in a relationship. When I was 16, he was 19. I could tell that he had romantic feelings and he let me know about six months into our friendship that he loved me. We didn't really have a stable friendship as he flipped out a lot and would go extended amounts of time without talking to me. He told me it because he couldn't bear to talk to me knowing that we can't be together 
because I was dating someone else. But I now know that it was more of a control thing, and he wanted to stop talking to me to make me feel like I'm missing something. He really hated women, really, really disliked women, and felt like most of them were just really bad. He told me he felt like I was different, that I was the only true woman that he's ever met. That's a big red flag. I was young and I didn't really think much of it. Our friendship was only online, I messaging and FaceTiming. Now, when he went on these tangents where he would just abruptly stop talking to me, he would go on Twitter and make offensive demonizing tweets about me to people. Like awful stuff. When he came back, I just like ignored that stuff because he would go back to being funny and nice. Now, I'm building up to our IRL meeting, hang in there with me. So, he also had a habit of lashing out at people, taking revenge on people and just making people feel like crap for fun. Another red flag. But I thought that I was special and that he really cared about me, and he would never do anything like that to me. I remember leading up to my 18th birthday, him being 21 now, he said to me, When you're 18, you're sending me nudes. You don't get to say no. I brushed it off because I knew that I wouldn't. But yeah, I noticed there's just this element of him wanting to dominate. Anyway, fast forward two years later, I'm now 18 and a freshman in college. In October, I broke up with my boyfriend, the same guy as I had at 16, and Flip took that as an opportunity. He would tell me he couldn't bear not seeing me, and that basically, we have to meet or it's all over. Now, I didn't really have romantic feelings for him. My love for him was platonic, but I figured like, I'll try the romance. I try to love him romantically. I couldn't lose him. So I impulsively bought a plane ticket to where he lives in December. My parents have no idea and to this day they still don't. I was going to go away on a Friday and come back on a Monday. The college that I go to has a school in the city with an airport, so it was easy to just Uber to the airport. This romance that I'm trying to project feels real and I genuinely feel like I loved him romantically. I was finally going to meet the guy that I loved. Now leading up to the flight, about one to two weeks before, I started getting cold feet. I was questioning the legitimacy of my feelings and started getting it on with a guy in a neighboring uni. I started catching feelings for him and I kissed him a day before my flight. At that point, I had already decided I didn't want to pursue Flip romantically, and I figured, hey, we've been friends for two years. When I get there, I'll tell him that I only want to stay friends. Yeah, he'll be upset, but I'm sure our friendship is worth more than that, and we'll be able to have a nice, enjoyable time together. How naive I was. I decided to go on the trip anyway, thinking that maybe seeing him would reignite that fire. Upon arrival, I realized that I did not love him, and I was no longer attracted to him. Regardless, though, he was a close friend of mine for a very long time, and whether I felt a romantic connection or not, I wanted to meet him for the sake of meeting him, just how I would want to meet any internet friend. And so, it's time for the flight. It's very early. I remember sitting on the plane contemplating walking out. I really just wanted to leave and not return. I should have listened to my gut. I arrive and I go outside of the terminal. I see him sitting in his car just staring at me, like a very malicious, piercing stare. After a few moments he gets out of the car. He looks different. It's strange because we had FaceTime and I had seen pictures of him but he looks different, kind of creepier. We hug and sit in the car. It's awkward and I feel awkward. We make small talk and awkward jokes and, and in that moment, I wanted to be back in my dorm. We go back to his apartment and we go up to his room. We smoke some weed and I lay down in his bed to sleep. When I wake up, he's spooning me and trying to fondle me. I take his hands off and tell him to stop and then I sit up and basically unload about how I don't want him romantically, only as a friend. He just started crying and begging me to tell him that I love him. I tell him that I can't do that. He then stands up, drops crying and goes to the bathroom and starts lighting stuff on fire. It smells like burning paper in the bedroom now. 
He comes out normally and just sits on his computer and plays games without talking to me. Now, the rest of the trip is just like a combination of him being kind and normal to him being completely evil. Here are some of the things that he's done and said throughout the three days. He made jokes about me dying. He would pretend to hit me, like lunge at me and get close enough and watch as I flinched. Told me that he also sent a snap of me to my mom with the geotag of his town so that I would get in trouble. Told me that he almost made me sleep in the car one night. Told me that one night while I was sleeping, he walked over me and started farting on me. He kept telling me to shut up when I would speak or ask questions. Did it multiple times in front of his roommates too. He was trying to feel me up in bed and I kept pushing his hands away. And he would keep trying and would say things like, I know you want it, you're just holding back. He was calling me an idiot whenever I would ask questions. Served me spaghetti and told me he purposely used the moldy spaghetti sauce hoping that I would get sick. Told me that he was going to make me miss my flight home. Said that he was planning to drive in the opposite direction of the airport and dropping me off in the middle of nowhere. So basically, I kept my cool. And when he would tell me these things, I would nod and agree and laugh with him. I was scared out of my mind and I wanted nothing more than to leave. So I kind of just kept it cool and I spent my time trying not to upset him. Monday rolls around and my flight is until 8pm. Around 11am he goes downstairs to leave and in that time I pack my bag and leave without him knowing. My plan of action is to run to the nearest shopping plaza and Uber to the airport from there. I wasn't about to Uber from his house. I am almost to the end of the street, feeling free, when I feel two arms come up from behind and wrap around me. He's hugging me, mumbles something in my ear and then turns around and dead on sprints back down the street to his apartment. I ran to the shopping plaza, called an Uber and I got it. I felt so much relief in that moment. I felt like I was free. I waited at the airport with nothing to do for 8 hours but it was better than being in there. I look back and I feel like an idiot. Like I should have gone to a hotel and I should have probably left. But I'm a broke college kid and I was already scared out of my mind being there without my parents' knowledge. After I left, I blocked him on every social media outlet that I have. He even linked in. He still has tried to contact me regularly for four months but luckily, I never even told him my address or anything. A few months ago, my sister started talking to a boy online named Ben. The two of them had a lot in common and were only about a year apart in terms of age. We didn't think anything of it at first because it's normal to have online friends these days. My sister is really introverted, so it was nice to hear that she had someone that she could talk to. From what I understand, Ben was also there for her emotionally too, if that makes sense. My sister became quite attached to him. Ben also introduced her to a few of his friends as well. They all seemed like your typical edgy teenagers. The kinds that post selfies with emo song lyrics and stuff like that. Similar to what she does. Ben seemed like a normal caring friend. And even messaged me a couple of times when he was concerned about my sister being upset. He seemed genuine and I was happy my sister had found someone like this. One day, my sister asked my mom if she could meet up with the Ben in the city. He lived in another state and had organized to spend a week in our state with his aunt. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity for the two of them to meet up. They arranged a date and a time to meet in the city, and my mom and I went with her. When that day came though, he didn't even show up. He made some excuse that his aunt was driving him there and we figured she was probably concerned about Ben meeting someone he only knows over the internet. I'll admit, I did have a really bad feeling about their meetup while we waited for Ben to show, but I stupidly ignored it. My sister, understandably, was quite upset that he hadn't shown up. Ben messaged me to apologize to us for having to run around after him. He explained that his aunt can be unreasonable sometimes. At that moment, I believed he was a decent person, and he wasn't lying about his situation. A couple of months had passed with just the two of them chatting away like normal. 
At some point, my mom gets the idea that she and my sister could fly to his day to meet him, and his mom in case she was worried. Ben liked that idea and so they ordered the flight tickets. One day, out of the blue, my sister burst into my room, clearly frightened. She told me to block Ben and the two friends that he had introduced to her earlier. When I asked why, she explained to me that Ben had been a cover-up identity for a person that had previously threatened her using another account. All the pictures that he had posted were from someone else's account. She found this out and had confronted him. His two friends that he chatted with on his posts and everything were all fake accounts run by him to keep up the illusion. The person, after being confronted by my sister, admitted that they were keeping tabs on her. They had been chatting for months and she had likely told him some personal things too. The flights were immediately cancelled after my mom had found out and we were all scared about the whole thing. I still am and I'm even a little paranoid about sharing this. We couldn't tell the police because my sister was a dingus and didn't keep a copy of the messages the account had sent her. The account was taken down after we had informed the guy whose pictures were stolen about the incident. So, to whomever this person is, leave us alone. I recently received a friend request that reminded me of this story, so I'm going to share it here. This happened after I went to university, so I was 18. I made an effort to make friends after I moved onto campus, and ended up with a few groups to hang out with, including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from my classes that I liked well enough. There was one class before lunch where it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I would have lunch with because I got on fine with most people from the class and we were all trying to make an effort to be social. So when one girl, Lily, asked if I wanted to eat lunch together after that class, I didn't have any reason not to go. We talked about school and that kind of thing, nothing noteworthy, but she did ask me to get lunch with her again the next week. It became a pattern, and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine, but it did mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days. In hindsight, I suppose that was the point. One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media. This happened in front of Lily. I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple of seats over. It was a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore, and I still remember it. By the time that I got home later that day, Lily had sent me a friend request. No friends in common. I don't know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised, but I guess she had just dug through the university's social media pages and found me through there. It gave me a bad feeling, but surely, it was fine. She ended up messaging me a lot and commenting on anything that I posted. I told myself that she was just awkward and we became friends, if not close. I had known worse people. She still always got me to go eat lunch with her after our one shared class. But other than that, we rarely spend time together in person. I saw her around sometimes but I never went out of my way to hang out with her. So, it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also called Lily. This was something that clearly bothered Lily, not my girlfriend, who couldn't have found it less interesting. It's a common name. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name, or joked about it not suiting her. She clearly didn't like my girlfriend at all, and I had an idea of why. It was hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to unsettably hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it because what was I going to say? I had never known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me. I was also not interested in the least. Even ignoring the weird stuff that she pulled, Lily was not my type at all. She tended to dress and act in a way somewhere between a 50s housewife and one of those adults who is still obsessed with Disney princesses. 
Man, if you can picture that. Things took an uncomfortable turn out the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she usually did, Lily asked if I wanted to go for a walk with her. Again, I didn't exactly know how to refuse, so I said, all right. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me into the woods and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log and I joined her. She started talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried agreeing with her, but I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed almost on the verge of tears. I tried to think of an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily chose to kiss me without warning. It was uncomfortable to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think that I wouldn't see her for a while. I came back to university after the summer, moving into a house with all my friends. Without going off topic, there were some serious issues in my friend group. A lot of petty arguing and worse. I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of that school year as well. And basically the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily because it suddenly didn't seem as bad. That said, I didn't want to be alone with her. We talked mostly online. She was still constantly messaging me after all. One upside of everything was that I started dating a boy, and Lily was not pleased to hear that news. I think she had hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend, but as I said before, that was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship, so she must have thought that she had missed her chance to be with me. This is where the story gets bad. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I would occasionally talk about my life and mostly reblog to photos and stuff. I was on there one day when something odd had happened. One of the blogs that I had followed had received and asked with some phrases that I recognized. It took a second to register that it was taken from my about page. That made me freeze. I read the message properly. Someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text from my page, asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I cannot stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me like I was a character in a book that they were trying to study. The reply was basically, I don't know, sorry. But the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. It had linked to someone's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. As far as I knew, no one in real life other than my boyfriend knew about my page. Well, no prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I found was uh, like a shrine. She was using a fake name, but I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy red and pink page. There were a few posts about her interest, but most of the content was focused on her primary interest, me. Most of the posts were about me. There were accounts of things that I had done recently. He told me about such and such, and he went to a nightclub recently, etc. As well as references to things from as far back as I had known her. It was clear that she had been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline gathering up every scrap of information that she could collect about my life and was hoarding it here in her collection. This was some straight, deep web stuff. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our dates had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintances and getting food after class. She talked about the time she had forcibly kissed me in the woods, but she wrote it as if it had been mutual. She quoted lyrics from my favorite song and talked about how she would always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me just the way that he is, which answered another mystery about an anonymous love letter I had received earlier that year with the same wording. It got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. These weren't so nice. They got vicious talking about how he didn't deserve me. He didn't know what he had. If she was with me, she would be jealous of anyone else who came near me. So my boyfriend not being a jealous person meant that he didn't love me. 
It was angry and hateful. I didn't like to think about the sort of person who could write so obsessively being fixated on me. One thing that didn't make any sense at first was that the blog also made plenty of references to Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this person to me. Her post talked a lot about Stephen and how great a friend he was, and how much fun they had together, how he had looked out for her, and etc. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend, when one specific post made it all click. She had posted a photo and captioned it with, Stephen sent this to me. He knew that I would like it and I love it. Or something like that. The problem was, the photo was taken from my own page. I hadn't sent it to her. She took it from my page and then claimed this a fictional best friend of hers had shared it with her. Because, in her head, she had split me into two people. In her messed up fantasy life, I was both the perfect best friend who was also looking out for her and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her when I finally got over my sweet and kind boyfriend and all the other easy girls that I hung out with that she had made dozens of posts complaining about. Who was she complaining to? Oh, and Lily had an audience. She had asked open questions about me and her relationship with me, and got messages back from her followers. People who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of people agreeing with this stalker that my boyfriend didn't deserve me, and that we were bound to break up soon so I could be with Lily, the person I was clearly supposed to be with. She had this fake, fanfiction version of my life up for everyone to share their opinion on, and she had made herself out to be the hero of it all. I went maybe a month back into this page's history. I didn't look at everything that was there, it was a too much. So, I'm not sure how long this had been going on. I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing. I cannot stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me, with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure we ended up together, slamming my boyfriend, and building a fantasy life with two different versions of me in it that she clearly believed to be real, and then acting like it hadn't happened. She said nothing. She didn't address it. She changed the subject, even after I had pushed. And it was like she hadn't even registered what I said. I've never seen anything else like it. She had deleted the page, of course, or it at least changed the name, and hid it so I never found it again. It wasn't the end, though. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore, but we were still shoved together in classes, and she had started to actually scare me with what she might do next. I'm kind of a paranoid person. Knowing someone was obsessively tracking me for who knows how long, it freaked me out. The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him uncomfortable. He told me about it right away. What was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me that he cheated and wait for me to break up with him? Why would I want her after that? When that didn't work out for her, she tried hitting on three of my other friends, and none of them took the bait. She ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but made sure to send me messages while they were together, letting me know that she would rather be with me. No thanks. Lily made sure to stay in my life the whole time I was at university. There was a time when I had tried to pull away from her, and she had ended up starting rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity I had put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back, but it made me realize it was safer to let her think she was a part of my life while ignoring her, rather than doing something that would cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily still wanted to spend time together, but I knew that I didn't have to now. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I almost entirely stopped posting on social media that I knew she knew about. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations, asked me to meet up with her, attempts that I usually ignored. I didn't like to think she was still tracking me online, but she probably was. I don't know how, but she'd occasionally reference things that I mentioned online somewhere, somewhere that she shouldn't have known about. The last time that we had a real conversation, 
She sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoken at all in months and we hadn't talked about anything serious in much longer than that. Thinking about that conversation still makes my skin crawl, but I'll summarize what happened. At first, she asked me some other questions about how long I had known I was gay. I told her some basic stuff, the kind of thing I would tell anyone who asked, but then she changed the subject. She started talking about how I would feel about her if she was a boy, about wanting to be a boy for me. The messages quickly became weird. She went into plenty of detail about fantasies she had of the two of us. Again, we were not friends at this point. We had never been very close, at least not from my perspective, and we had barely spoken for years. I can't imagine sending messages like that to even a close friend, let alone someone who barely knows you. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, but she had decided to change tactics. She sent photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one had arrived. Basically quoting back what I had told her about myself and my past earlier. She was telling me these things as if they had happened to her. She was role playing as me. The worst part was that she seemed to believe it was real. Even when she was quoting me word for word. The things that I had told her only hours before were now her life. It was like she was trying to absorb my history to take it over. To make my life part of her. Yeah, I didn't talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts she made to talk to me, and I eventually silently deleted her from my inactive social media, which was her only real way of contacting me. I really thought that she might finally move on. A few days ago, she sent me a friend request. It's sitting there unanswered because I know that if I delete it, she'll only send another one. Lily and I met nearly 12 years ago, this story is just the highlights, and even then, it's only the stuff that I know about for sure. A lot happened behind my back, I know it did. I grew up with parents who were reasonable, loving people, but who were also more than a little paranoid when it came to the internet. Anything that allowed anonymous communication in any form was banned point blank from the household. Even Club Penguin wasn't allowed because you could chat in it. Naturally, when I got my first laptop at 12, it was a piece of crap. I only got it because of homework. The first thing I did was start trying to talk to people online. I wasn't going in chat rooms or anything because my parents' warnings still resonated with me, but I wasn't avoiding contact either. I ended up making a DeviantArt account, I know I know, cringe, where I didn't do much posting as I lack artistic talent. In spite of this, however, I was contacted via private message by a guy who I'll call Joker, because his profile picture was of the Joker. That should have been a warning sign in and of itself, honestly. Joker just started talking to me out of the blue. I think I had commented on one of his pieces or something, and he had reached out to thank me for my kind words. We started talking, and it turned out that we had a lot of common interests. We played some of these same games, liked some of the same cartoons. He seemed like a really, really nice guy. I think it was maybe a week or two in that the first uncomfortable thing had happened, even if I didn't exactly think much of it at the time. The two of us shared a somewhat misanthropic view of the world, so there were a lot of dark jokes passed between the two of us. Sometime about a week after we had first started messaging, he casually mentions thinking that the world would be better off without him. My sent him a sad face and assured him that it wouldn't, as I quite liked talking to him. He didn't say anything more about it then, so I assumed that was it. It wasn't. The Joker talked about this a lot. His talking about it quickly morphed from passing commentary to long and graphic rants about how much he hated himself and wanted to die and what method would be the best for him to do so. I spent hours talking him down over chat, terrified that one day I wouldn't be able to do enough and he would actually do it. His messages started to get creepy in a different way. He started telling me how grateful he was to me, how no one had ever cared about him as much as I did, how important I was for him, 
how he couldn't live without me, how he would just die if he were to ever lose me. He was obsessed. Well, one day a couple of months in, my laptop breaks. It wasn't too bad, but it still took a couple of days before everything was back in working order. I had logged back into DeviantArt to find dozens of messages, all from Joker. They started off normal enough, but quickly became frantic after I didn't respond. The last message he had sent was along the lines of, I can't take this anymore, followed by a link to a picture image. The image was of him hurting himself. I was horrified, and I quickly messaged him back, terrified that I lost a friend, and he responded, I thought I'd lost you, he said. I thought you had left me. I couldn't handle the pain without you. Don't you ever do that to me again. I said that I wouldn't, and he seemed relieved. He only got worse from then on, and reached a point where practically our every conversation consisted of him either professing his obsession with me, threatening hurting himself or both. The stress was keeping me up at night. I was terrified that one day, soon, I would open a chat to see nothing. I was utterly convinced it was my job to keep this guy alive, and that I was failing miserably at it. The Joker kept escalating until one day, nearly a year in, he finally said something that frightened me so badly I'd leave. The Joker started talking about how I was the last good person left on this miserable planet and stuff like that. He waxed poetic about how much he wanted to do it, and said that he'd finally found a way to truly be happy. He said the only way he would ever be able to find happiness was in doing this, and taking me with him. That way we would always be together, free from the cruel weights of the world. He started going into very detailed descriptions of how he would do it. A lot of them involved carving out my heart and then clutching it to his chest and laying beside me as he took his own life. I was terrified, enough so that I did what I should have done a long time ago and I deleted that account. For years following that incident, I never spoke to anyone online. Even to this day actually, there's still a lingering sense of dread when it comes to online interaction. So, I had met a guy online. We talked for a day or two, but I was at the tail end of my degree, and things were getting to be a lot. So, I decided no dating until I was done. I let the handful of guys that seemed nice know before deleting the dating app, so they would know why I deleted it, and wouldn't think that I had ghosted because of them. He happened to be online when I sent it and said that I seem cool, can we keep in touch? Sure, no worries, and I added him on Facebook. Maybe once a week, he's like, Hey, how are you? What are you up to? Just normal conversation stuff. I would chat about university, work, the gym, whatever. After maybe two to three months, he's like, Hey, we've been chatting for a bit. Let's grab coffee. I'm like, yeah, sure. He seems nice enough. I reiterated it would be his friends, and that was fine with him. I was about to head into exams, so we made plans for in three weeks' time after I had finished them. He had started messaging me more and more regularly after making plans, more than once a day, and he starts calling it a date, which people call catching up a coffee date without it meaning an actual date. But I wanted to make sure that we were still on the same page, so I just said, Hey, you keep calling it a date. Just making sure that we're clear, it's just a catch-up as friends. He snapped. He was sending me all sorts of horrible things on Facebook, so I block him. I had given him my number so we could make plans. So he started calling and calling, leaving voicemails. It was late, so I put my phone on silent and I went to sleep. The next morning, I wake up to 37 missed calls and voicemails between 10 p.m., continuing until 4 a.m., as well as a multitude of horrible texts. Now, this was seven years ago, when you couldn't just block someone on a phone. At first, I thought if I ignored him, he would get bored. After about a week, he wasn't slowing down, with dozens of calls a day. I called my phone company to get him blocked. 
And they said that you can only block three people, are you sure? I had to jump through all the hoops and then they turned around and said that they couldn't do it. So I would have to call the police. So I called the police and they say that I have to call the phone company, but I can make a statement of harassment in case he does something more. Three weeks later, he's still going strong, but in his text, he starts saying he's going to force me to go on a date with him, and that I won't have a choice and blah blah. And then he starts saying that if I won't come to him, he'll come to me, and is telling me my schedule with where I will be at any given time, which he put together based on our weekly conversations about normal stuff, threatening to come to where I'll be. My had to stop doing my regular activities and pretty much become a hermit. He ended up making a threat to my life. I can't remember what he said word for word, but it was essentially, girls like you get what they deserve, or something like that. But more clearly threatening, he would be the one to make it happen. I contacted the police again, and that was enough for an RVO, and I never heard from him again. Oh, and I was 20, but his pictures looked younger, so I didn't realize online, but it turned out this guy was 34. So, this wasn't dumb young kid behavior. This was a grown man. Now, I've had many other psychos since this guy, but I'm very grateful phones have since allowed you to block anyone, anytime. A little background. I grew up in my teens in a big city. Because of abuse, I was hypersexualized but refrained out of fear. If it matters, I'm a white male. While in junior high, I had a few friends but was not shy or reclusive, just an average boogerhead. While outside on lunch break, I was walking by the monkey bars. A couple of girls were sitting on the chin-up bars off to the side. As I passed, one of the girls started talking to me. Just normal questions, who are you, what grade, your age, etc. One of the girls made the spin, down or they slept. Anyway, she was hanging upside down by one knee. She had locked her other leg in a similar position and turned loose with her hands. Her skirt slid down right over her head. She was fully exposed since her bra didn't fit right. Everyone was laughing and looked, but no one was helping. And no one noticed the tissue that I could plainly see. I grabbed her shirt and pulled it up to cover her, helped her to get down and walked with her to the building. I figured, good deed done, not quite. After school, she was waiting for me. She gave me a hug and then kissed me on the mouth. I pulled back because I didn't know this person and I didn't want to get involved. I guess she thought I was offended and she asked me, what's wrong? I told her that no, it wasn't a problem being kissed. And she asked what the problem was. I truthfully told her that I did not remember her name, and I didn't know her. She laughed and said, Letitia. We said goodbye and I went and caught the bus. The following Monday, Letitia is waiting for me at lunch. She tells me that she never did thank me for saving her. I told her not to worry about it, it's cool. We walked around the soccer field and then she stops me with her hand and says, My mom wants to meet you. I asked her why and she tells me that she told her mom what had happened and how she wants to meet me. She goes on to say, she's picking me up so you can meet her then. And we go back to our classes. I never was academically inclined, so now the dang day would just not move along. School ends and after dragging my butt, I meet Letitia. We walk to the parking lot and she gets all happy and says, oh there's my mom. We walk over and her mom gets out of the car and gives me a hug. I'm internally losing it. She says how good it is to meet me, how nice I was to have been there for her daughter, and then she says, you should come over for dinner. Um, what are you talking about? I start making excuses about how my parents don't like me out on school nights, and she says, oh, don't worry, it's all taken care of. I already called your mother. Dinner tomorrow night at six. They get in their car and I get on the bus, cussing phone books. Mother, why did you say yes? She replies that it will do me good to meet other people and girls. I had visions of telling her, oh, that I've met her all right. I've seen some stuff too. We even tongue wrestled. 
The next day just stings. It takes forever and at the same time, it jerks forward at warp speed. Lunch break truly sucked. Letitia told everyone that I was going to her house for dinner. Oh, and to meet my dad. I was seriously freaking out. I walked back to the building and spent the rest of the school day planning my getaway while answering questions about dinner. What's for dinner? The day ends without me having a plan. She walks me to the bus since her mom isn't there yet. And then she kisses me again and the bus driver was watching too. I get home, say not one word to anyone and go to my room. My mom pops her head in and tells me to change for my date and goes back to where the hell she came from. She drives me over and says that they'll bring me home. No, you come and get me. I don't know these people. I don't know why I'm going, why I was invited or anything. You should come get me mom or I'm not going. She agrees and tells the teacher's mother that she'll pick me up. They agreed on a time and my mom leaves. I meet her three brothers, her two sisters, a cousin, and her grandmother. Everyone was cool. Well, one brother kept giving me the stink eye, but there's nothing I can do, so I ignored it. I thought maybe, just maybe, I could hang out with the three brothers, even the one with the stink eye, but that didn't happen. I ended up there sitting next to Grandma, which was cool because Letitia was hovering. After about 15 minutes of nothing, her dad comes home, and this man is huge. He steps up to me as I stand, I thought about running, and he smothers my hand in his. He says, So, you're the boy who was seen and rescued my daughter. I stood there and thought that I was going to pass out. He asked me a couple of questions that I just nodded or shook my head to. My mind is screaming at me to talk. He says, take a seat, and I did. He spoke for a while, telling me that relationships were difficult at best. I can feel my neck twisting around to look at Letitia, while he says that at most, you can expect a little hostility. She walks over and sits above me on the arm of the couch. I'm looking at her dad and then her, over and over again. She reaches out and takes my hand. I finally find my words and whisper, What did you tell them? She laughed and said, just that we were girlfriend and boyfriend. I didn't mention the other thing we did. No, oh, heck no, I'm thinking. You kissed me. Do you think that she whispered this and not a chance? Her dad stops talking and is just looking at us. Her grandmother, having sat right there the whole time, turns and adjusts her seat on the couch so she too can look at us. I'm turning red, embarrassed, yes, but I'm getting upset. Her dad says, What thing? I told him, She kissed me. It came out as an accusation. He looks at me and then looks at her. He takes a deep, slow breath and says, Well, maybe you two will make it. When the two of you are old enough, and if you still want to, I'll give you my blessing. Blessing for what, I say. He says, You'll marry my daughter. I'm stunned. I'm having a major brain fart. I snap out of it when she starts sliding on the arm like she's going to land on me. I popped up and ran out the door. Forget being picked up. I'm running home. I eventually get home to an empty house. I go to my room and lay on the bed. The phone rings. I go into the kitchen and answer it and it's my neighbor. He asks if I'm okay and I say that I am. He tells me that my mom is out driving the street looking for me. She got a call that I had left in a rush and everyone was worried. I said that I was fine and I hung up. I turned on a lamp in the living room to show that someone was home and I went to bed. The phone rings again, but I return to the kitchen and answer. You will marry my daughter. It was her dad. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing the phone games again. Sir, I wouldn't marry your daughter for anything, he says. You will marry her, I said. I don't know what she's told you. I don't know if she is as crazy as you are, but I am not repeat. Not marrying her or anyone else. I helped her and she kissed me. I don't even know her name. We are not dating and we have never dated and we never will. He got quiet for a bit, then he said. Is what you just said is true? I replied, every word. 
he tells me to watch out for his sons until he can collect them. And then he hangs up. Brothers, son of a gun. The brothers then announce themselves with a pounding on the door. Oh, it's the whole family. They are totally not. I start gearing up with multiple sweaters and two pairs of blue jeans. I get my bat ready and I walk into the living room. I look out the bay window. They're still there. I look at my dad's gun rack, but I don't grab one. I know they're loaded. I do mentally select the weapon I will use if everything goes left. The banging is stopped and I look out the window again. The neighbor is talking to the brothers. While I watch, first my mom pulls into the driveway and then their father pulls up. My mom goes and talks to them. I can picture her telling them to all come in. After a minute or two, she comes in. Are you okay? Mom, was this some kind of joke or prank? Please say yes. She walks over and hugs me and says, No. Son, you did a good thing at school. Don't let this stop you from doing the right thing. She continued. I'm sorry, I had no idea. I went to my room where I just sat there. I don't even remember what I was thinking. To this day, almost 40 years later, I just shake my head when this memory returns. I was about 13 or 14 and I was babysitting two boys for some church members. I had done it before and the kids had loved me and the parents were very comfortable with me. This was a night where they were going to be gone for pretty much until like 2.30 in the morning. I was doing it for free that day because they were going to do something church related and that's just how I rolled. Anyway, the house they lived in was an apartment complex. You know, one of those small ones that had two floors and four places in each spot. They're on the bottom floor with two bedrooms on either side of the apartment, with the kitchen on the left and the living room on the right, with the sliding glass door to a small patio and a public bathroom next to the front door. It was about, I think, 1.30 and I knew they would be getting home soon. The kids were conked out. Obviously, after practically begging and three bedtime stories, and I had finished my homework and they didn't have cable. This was before Netflix was ever a thing. So, they had a couple of DVDs and VHSs to watch, so I grabbed Land Before Time to make the night go quicker. I was already very tired and I nodded off a couple times. At about 2, I could hear knocking on the front door. Knowing the parents had a key, I did nothing but sit there in the dark with the TV glowing. Being a paranoid person and who watches and reads enough horror, I grabbed the baseball bat that was next to the couch. And what happened next will haunt me forever. I heard a small voice, almost like a young woman's. Oh dear, that won't help you now. My heart stopped, and I realized the patio door didn't have the blind shut. My eyes shift slowly to the door and I see someone on the patio staring in. I couldn't make out anything other than that they were very short and wide. I screamed and ran into the kids' room. Thankfully, they were all still asleep. Sadly, this was before I had a cell phone, and there were no cordless phones. All I did was push the dresser in front of the door and stared out of the one window of the room. That's when it became dark as a shadow loomed on the window. The knocking started again, and the woman's voice called out. Oh, come on, dearie. I won't hurt you. Please come out. The window was being knocked on so hard that I was afraid it would break. The kids finally woke up, and they were all screaming, and they were really scared. I was a big girl and could at that time lift my own weight. But knowing that I had two kids with me, I became very vulnerable and afraid. Within two seconds, I hear the father yell out, Hey, who the heck are you? And the person on the porch ran off. The front door opened, and there was a harsh knocking on the kid's bedroom door. Thankfully, it was the parents, and after I let them in and put the dresser back, I explained what had happened, and they called the police. When they arrived, they obviously found nothing but the bushes that tied the patio. They were obviously cut up and ripped up to get through. 
I babysat for them once more after that, but after they moved away about five months later, I never babysat anyone ever again. And again to this day, I know the woman was long gone, but every time I hear a knock, a chill just runs through me. It's been about 11 years. It was autumn and nighttime, and I decided to take a little walk around our housing estate with my dog, Sunny. Sunny is a black and big Labrador mix. She is really good and cuddly, but she hates other female dogs. She also has a strong protective instinct and always snarls when she doesn't know or doesn't like someone or something. There were no streetlights inside the settlement. The only lighting was always at the house entrances. There is a small park with small playgrounds between the row of houses. But, as already mentioned, everything was in complete darkness. That's why Sunny was not to be seen. Only to be heard now and then when she was chasing a rabbit into the bushes. And then it goes without saying that she wasn't on a leash. I only need this when other female dogs are nearby. Sunny listens to my word and always comes when I call her. So, when I strode comfortably through the dark settlement and froze my butt off, Sunny ran happily through the area and the bushes. I always only guessed where she was, because I could not see her, only heard her from time to time. At some point, I noticed a small shadow that was whizzing around me. When I looked more closely, I could see Sunny. She ran in large circles around me in the place where I was and I thought that she was chasing something. But the circles she drew grew smaller and smaller. She didn't make any noise and I went on comfortably because I thought she was having her five minutes. At some point, I didn't see her anymore, but I went on knowing that she would follow. And then I heard a sound, footsteps, but they weren't my own. I was startled because they were so close behind me so suddenly and so I turned around but couldn't see anything thanks to the darkness. I got nervous and called for Sunny because it could have been someone with a dog. Sunny didn't come and I easily panicked. She suddenly stood in front of me out of nowhere and began to growl as violently as she had never done before. My blood froze because it couldn't be a good thing. And then she started walking straight ahead, growling about two or three meters. Stopped and at that moment I recognized a figure, completely in black. The person was shocked in front of Sunny and didn't move and Sunny started barking like there was a no tomorrow. This person slowly walked backwards toward the lighted house entrances and then I saw Sunny bare teeth in front of a young man wearing a hooded sweatshirt and probably started to experience the same fears as I did when I noticed him. Because as close as he had snuck up on me, he couldn't have had any good in mind. Since it was too dark, however, he could not see Sunny and she must have surprised him at the right moment. Sunny started to jump and at that moment, the guy let out a scream and you could hear something falling from his hand on the floor. He ran and my dog followed. After I had released myself from my shock stiffness, I called out to Sunny as loud as I could, until after a short time, she was standing in front of me again, wagging her tail. I took her on the leash and then went to where the guy had dropped something and indeed, there was an arm thick branch on the floor that he certainly didn't have with him to throw sticks. At home, it gradually dawned on me that my Sunny did not have her five minutes when she had circled me, but that she had long since noticed and kept an eye on this piece of crap to protect me. On the one hand, that was creepy but also a relief. I was and still am so grateful for this great dog.